All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Kristen Sanchez. I am the events executive for Higher Things, and I am joined uh, right now with our four plenary speakers for this summer's Higher Things Beyond Reasonable Doubt conferences. Um, I'm going to go around circle and introduce everybody so you know who you are watching and listening to, and then we're going to jump in. So we have our two speakers from our first conference at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois, and that is Dr. Adam Francisco. You wave, Dr. Francisco. Uh, he's the Director of Academics and Scholar in Residence at 1517. I get that all right? You did. Spot on. Very good. Uh, and then Pastor Harrison Goodman, he is the Content Executive at Higher Things. Uh, so those two are going to start our conference season out at SIU in Carbondale. And then the following week, we're going to be down at Trinity University in San Antonio. And that's going to be with Pastor Chris Rosebro, who is at Kongsvinger Lutheran Church in Oslo, Minnesota, as well as being the captain of Pirate Christian Radio. So we've got Pastor Rosebro, and then we've got Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, who is the pastor at St. Paul Lutheran Church and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Church, both in Austin, Texas, Pastor Wolfmuller. So, all right, so our plan tonight is just to pull the curtain back a little bit and get a, give everybody kind of a um, backstage view of what it takes to get our plenaries ready for the summer conferences. Um, as everybody knows, our theme for this year is Beyond Reasonable Doubt, with the theme verse being 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And herein lies the crux of, of our faith. And so um, we want to hear a little bit from you guys kind of on how you guys are going about preparing for this uh, summer season and all of that. Um, just kind of to get you all started on some thoughts. I, I'm curious because this conference season is going to be going at uh, defending the faith that defends you on one hand. And then at the same time, looking at the fact that our, our youth that we are, that we're going to be teaching have serious doubts and questions about what's going on in their lives and, and the faith that they have. Um, and so caring for their souls as they're going through that, but starting kind of with apologetics, what is it that actually shapes our apologetics of our faith? what's this no it's this this is this is how you play not it I, i'll tell you how i was preparing to talk about that is just have dr francisco send me his notes so he should i think as the expert here should seriously wolf miller well i just got off a plane so i'm a little foggy headed um i i would say um you know apologetics of course is the defense of the faith but it's uh christian apologetics is a especially a defense or a an argument for the truthfulness of Christianity uh, on the basis especially of the well the incarnation of God in Christ as as to, to use kind of academic language as verified by the resurrection from the dead yeah uh, that's the that's the central as Pastor Wolf Mueller once put it the central argument of the church through the ages that Christ rose from the dead uh, he, he died for our sins, rose for our justification, but it's the resurrection that, for lack of a better way of putting it, makes it true or vindicates it is probably a better way of describing it. Yeah, the world we live in, uh, people seem to think that, you know, that the claims of Christianity, um, it's like taking a leap into the dark and that somehow Christians believe against the evidence um, and as a result of that, um, it's not rational or sane or logical to believe in Jesus Christ, uh, you know, being the incarnate Son of God and that He has risen from the dead. And so you'll note that the world we live in, um, I think kids nowadays have access to, um, at, uh, on their phones, uh, really bad arguments, which really circulate very quickly through places like Instagram, Snapchat, and, and TikTok. And uh, and there's whole channels really dedicated to uh, making Christians look like some kind of like backwoods Neanderthals for believing in the claims of Christ or trusting the Bible. And there's kind of standard uh, rhetorical arguments are marshaled against the veracity of the Christian faith. And so uh, this conference is going to give us the opportunity to knock some of that down. It's so important what Paul says about the resurrection. Is it because it's a historical event? I mean, it's not really that astonishing that a man died on a cross. The astonishment is that God died on the cross. And then the equally core amazing thing is it's not so astonishing 
that a god lives forever, but that a man is risen from the dead. And this is now the basis of our faith, that the the God-man, Jesus Christ, is both dead and alive for us on a date. I mean, it happened. We just celebrated the 1,990th anniversary of the resurrection of Jesus. And, and our faith is not some sort of abstraction, but in that, and, and I, I'm interested in, and hope to be able to hone in on the results that that has in the conscience. Because as Jesus resurrected from the dead, ascends to the throne of God, and there presents his blood for our our forgiveness, he sends the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, it's an amazing thing, Jesus says, it's a good thing that I'm going from you right before he dies in his race. Because if I didn't go, I wouldn't send the Holy Spirit. So he sends the Holy Spirit to testify of the same thing in our own hearts. So I think I, I think apologetics a lot of times focuses on the on the rational argument, but it seems to me like the rational arguments are almost always presented as roadblocks just to protect the heart, so the heart doesn't have to deal with the fact that God is ca calling you a lawbreaker and then atoning for that sin. So. So how do we address the rational arguments, but also do it with an eye towards the conscience? Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing more devil-proof than a good conscience. There's mm -hmm. nothing more spiritually strong than a good conscience. So I think our apologetics also needs to have an eye toward that pastoral comfort. I think there's a lot there. Um, most of the time when we talk about sort of how do you prove Christianity, the world would actually root it wholly in the Christian um, and not in God at all, which is a weird place to prove that God exists by proving that somebody's not God. Um, but we've got this, this place where the world will point out all of our sins to us and say, look, this is, this is the sum of your religion. You're just as bad as the rest of us. And an apologetic is a chance to look outside of sort of the certainty of your own heart, how you feel in any given moment, or, or even worse, the certainty of your own actions, which are usually... Well, yeah. Um, and, and here we get to go to something verifiable that happened in time and space history that that I can go to when I am not enough. And when the world can say, look, you're you're just the sinner that everybody else is. And the devil can approach me and, and say, your conscience shouldn't be all that all that calm. You, you're a sinner. And if there's such a thing as God, he's going to be real mad at you. And I can say he rose from the dead. Not only is there such a thing as God, but but there there's actually something then to say for all the places where I am not God that that maybe that's even a good thing. Uh, I think there's a commandment against it. <laughs> I'm loving watching you guys work these two things together, right? That you guys are taking these and already starting to find how they are they work together and come come apart and together. It's beautiful. Um, so, what do you think is the appropriate place for apologetics in a youth's everyday life when they leave this conference? Where are they going to be taking this and and applying it to their everyday life? Obviously, this is to go on the internet and uh, read atheist comments in a sarcastic voice in the same way that they have read scripture quotes in a sarcastic voice, right? Right, yeah. That's the telos of everything right there. <laughs> it's so that they can make spicy memes, yeah. That's... Why did you become Christian trolls? That's yeah. right. <laughs> well, I think, it, I mean, it all comes back to spiritual warfare. Uh, I mean, we we always are fighting with the devil, and and Paul talks about this. We we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. We don't wage war, as the world wages war, but we're tearing down arguments. So the arguments, how does Paul say it? Exalt themselves against Christ. Like it's like the Tower of Babel. It's the the, the arguments that come to the Christians, this human flesh and pride. And so, so a part of the role of apologetics is that uh, each Christian becomes their own sort of demolition crew. And they're able to demolish the arguments that are exalted against Christ. And so so equipped with that, and, and not just equipped with like the particular argument, but with the way of thinking, right? Because, I mean, the devil's always master of a thousand arts and everything. He's going to always come with a different argument. Yeah. So we got to know how to recognize the, the devil's voice versus the voice of the good shepherd. And to say, hey, look, th this thing that you're you're telling me, this this leads away from from comfort and it leads away from godliness and and both of those are not how I've how I've been taught to learn Christ. Yeah, I I would note one of one of the challenges is that atheists would tend to make you believe that the reason why they don't believe in God is because of lack of evidence. But the scripture is clear that the reason why an atheist doesn't believe in God is because they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. 
And so the demolition emphasis that uh, Pastor Wolfmuller has given is actually a good one. You can almost think of apologetics as a work of the law, because when you're demolishing bad arguments, uh, then you know that you're what you're doing is you're taking away things and pointing out their their hypocrisy, their idolatry, uh, and the fact that they actually already know what the truth is, but they're pushing it away. Uh, but it that but the telos is not the uh, the the demolition of their arguments. Oh, after their arguments have been demolished, then we must preach the gospel and tell them the good news of what Christ has done for them, because otherwise we just turn into a bunch of uh, you know like academic pinheads who uh, exalt ourselves based upon our academic prowess and our great argumentation. That's never the point. Apologetics is always serving a purpose, and I think of what. Uh, Paul writes that, you know, is actually Peter, to always be ready to give a, a reason, the hope that lies within you. That requires you to preach the gospel. And so um, so part of what we have to do is help our help students understand that it's not their job to uh, to prove that God exists. It's their job to demolish arguments because the atheist already knows that God exists. They're just suppressing it. And so the arguments work to help kind of uh, to do that demolition work. In the more the you made, I don't want to say academic side of things because I'm afraid Pastor Rover will make fun of me for being a pinhead. I thought but, he was uh, making fun of you already. <laughs> when he said academic pinhead, I just looked. <laughs> I just knew it wasn't me. <laughs> this appropriation of my of my metaphor here. <laughs> there's there's a distinction that's uh, usually made in in apologetics. There's the like the negative side. And that's this um, deconstruction or demolition i guess is the term we've been using of of uh claims arrogant claims to know things about god or his non-existence or, or what have you um i think i should just look it up but i'm too lazy right now i think like, that's second corinthians 10 4 right you know we we is that right one of you guys can look that up the, the tearing down too, of the arguments yeah 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 um the other side though is a you know, we could just call it a positive apologetics, um, which on occasion that, you know, the, the young people learning apologetics, one thing you're, you might experience, or at least this was my experience and a bunch of my friends is sitting through my first apologetics course over 15 weeks at Concordia University in Irvine, I mean, maybe two classes into it. I just remember thinking to myself, wait a minute, you mean Christianity is true in a kind of normal sense of the term? Like I can argue for it, for its truthfulness, if the occasion presents itself, you know, that there's good reason to believe uh, that Jesus isn't just some cleverly devised myth, but was in fact the son of the very son of God. So there is a, there are occasions um, for arguing to the Christian faith, that positive side. But I would think you know, for, for young people, whether they're you know, junior high or high school, um, one, at least this is also another autobiographical comment. Hopefully that's the last of it tonight. Uh, you don't need to hear about me so much, but um, I, I oftentimes, I study apologetics like day in and day out. I, when I'm driving my kids to jujitsu or the grocery store, I can't get these voices out of my head. And it's not because I'm, well, there might be a bit of that, but it's, I wrestle all the time with the faith i i'm just wired in a way that makes me skeptical of of everything i'm not skeptical of the truthfulness of the christian faith but because my demeanor is always questioning things it you know i'm always wondering you know always testing things you know living what socrates or if i still live in california i probably pronounce it socrates called the examined life um um not that he's anywhere on par with Jesus or Paul or Peter, but uh, there are, I mean, I imagine some of the youth, maybe it'll be a lot of the youth this, this summer, though they might attend church Sunday after Sunday, have those questions uh, that maybe they are a little afraid to ask the pastor. Uh, but don't, I'm here to say, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you can say I make a living doing apologetics um, at all, but um I have those those questions myself. So in a way, I kind of do apologetics for the Muslims and the atheists I encounter to be sure, but I also do it for well for my kids and and for myself. Um, 
Um, I'm just wired that way. I've got to be able to give myself an answer uh, when I'm starting to have those 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 uh, dark nights of the soul, so to speak. Well, because what's the flip side of that? I mean, what's the point if you don't, or what, what's the what's the end result if you don't, if you aren't able to give a defense to something? I mean, it's so personal to every personal or to every person. What's the point, right? What's the flip side of that? Can, can I keep keep uh, stealing or hogging the mic? Yeah, please do. Uh, another thing, I, I'm on those lines, like what is the point? Because I've spent, and probably everybody here has spent a good amount of time with decided non-Christians, whether they're atheists or, or, but think of the decided non-Christian who's of a different religion, Muslim, Jewish, or Jew, uh, uh, Buddhist, whatever. Um, they have their belief system, so to speak. They have their sacred texts. Why not one of those? I mean, apologetics helps us navigate this sort of very you know, diverse uh, space we live in with all sorts of voices claiming, even though they might not say it this way, but claiming to have a, a, a corner on the truth. Uh, and Christianity has kind of been relegated, sadly, uh, to just one voice among a whole bunch of other voices. But more often than not, it's even gotten worse in that all those other voices seem to have been elevated and Christianity has been relegated to the corner or to the, the far margins and even is seen as dangerous in in some circles. So um, this is not answering your question, but I think I mean, there's always a moment for apologetics. Not every moment is an apologetic occasion, but right now, my goodness, if there's something you've got to learn going into the college or into the future, along with basic catechesis, uh, I got to learn how to answer those people who might ask you for a reason for the hope within you. Luther I would to... say this is, let me, one, one Luther quote, we got to really get a Luther thing in here, because Luther had something to say about apologetics. He said, this is a task when he's reflecting on 1 Peter 3.15 that uh, has to be learned from youth, because oh. it's one of the most difficult things to do. Is, and he's when he was writing that, he was anticipating a day where Christians would be taken captive and uh, subjugated as slaves of Ottoman Turks, that is uh, Muslims. So anyway, sorry for cutting off. Pastor no, Mark. that's great. That was uh, one of the things, and I'm I want to bounce this idea off of you guys, is that... Maybe slave? <laughs> that's what Goodman, who they, um, is that... So, so I'm thinking about comparative worldviews really um I, I and i always wish i had a better word but to, to so to think of this how, how do we diagnose what i'm being told by the other religion by the world by the secular culture so, so that we're all in the, in the middle of a story with four chapters it, uh, john stone street kind of simplified this and i thought it was pretty good we are all living in a story with four chapters a beginning how things went wrong how things get fixed and how things are going to end and those four questions are necessary for us to kind of con to to have any sort of meaning in our lives or pr and especially purpose and so forth so that we're all living in a story of it's, it's somehow this got started somehow things went wrong somehow things did get fixed or will get fixed and somehow it's going to end and so if we just take those four questions and compare what the bible says to any other uh competing story then that gives us a, a great framework for diagnosing what i'm being told so the world tells me you know it, we all started with an explosion this is just all shrapnel and things went wrong when we invented the uh internal combustion engine so we're going to end in the, uh, the global warming or whatever you know unless we save ourselves through carbon emissions or, or whatever you know everything has its has its own cosmology and the christian story comes now into the argument and says here's how it happened I mean, things went wrong in the garden and things went right in the on the cross in the empty tomb. And we're all headed towards the resurrection so that uh, those four questions, I think, give a, a marvelous comparative framework. I'd love but I'd love your thoughts on that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I wrestle with it. I think of. Um, one of the things I've been not dealing with, but uh, thinking about because it came up in my youth group uh, a while ago is the, what's sometimes called the problem of evil. You know, how is it that 
God can be all loving and all powerful and yet tremendous evil exists, you know, natural and man-made and, and so on. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a history of responses to that. More often than not, when people bring that up, they're not really looking for a philosophical response or they're dealing with some sort of tragedy, but, but I'm kind of coming around to the point, like you said, Pastor Wolf Miller, that the, the explanation of how there is evil in the world and how it will be resolved in the end really is only adequately dealt with from a biblical worldview. All the other, I mean, I've not studied every single religion out there, but the ones I know of, they really stink on this question. <laughs> like the, you know, the Muslims will turn, like the real real serious Orthodox Muslims will turn God into the author of, of evil. He's the author of every single moment. He creates and he destroys, and he creates and destroys in constant. So everything that happens is a direct creation of God, um, including things like the Holocaust, right? we got to throw that in there. you always got to throw a Holocaust example in everywhere today. But um, um, how do they say it? Inshallah. So, inshallah, that's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> um, but then you got the atheist line. They can't even really talk about evil. You know, like on what grounds, like what's the standard from which they're calling something evil there you know an atheist worldview it falls short because it's so nihilistic it just it says there's i mean the stuff we're all looking at on the screen is just an arrangement of chemicals and i don't even know i can't even talk tech so it's stuff you know just arbitrary <laughs> you know um so yeah the that i i we should talk some maybe well you're going to be in texas you won't be in carbondale but that, that that four part story that's a, that's fascinating. That that's something to worth worth uh, I think exploring more. There's Not kind of thirty some, minutes. <laughs> there, there's kind of something to it though that that like the atheist will sort of find more comfort in punk rock and each other than in the idea of a loving God because a, a loving God is almost harder to explain. The cross is actually a helpful thing for this. The empty tomb is is a, a, an indication that God is not either punishing you for your bad things by having bad things happen to you um, or simply abandoning his creation or um, but but rather he's right in the middle of it that that when there is suffering, we have a God who who dives down into the mix, who who bears the suffering for us upon the cross and refuses to be far from us that that suffering then stops being a mark of God's absence and it starts being a mark of his presence. Um, you don't have to like that they're, that there's suffering. you don't have to like that it hurts, but at the same time you get to sort of watch the finality of it as, as Christ breathes his last and and look then to that that empty tomb that is not just sort of that well wishing of, of better days to come, but a historical event that did happen. You, you can sort of address your your sufferings and your I don't want this moments with something that has already been brought to a conclusion that that like you can actually measure in time and space. and then you, you can you can look to something that that is is concrete and accessible that that God doesn't abandon us in this suffering, but you can find him in his church now too. It, it's not that he's far away when it hurts. It, it look to the cross. it's the symbol of our religion. like what did you think it was gonna feel like? but you know, now there's at least there's at least hope down here. Yeah, I, I would even add to this idea that um, when you study the other world religions, um, the, the, her, the her historical veracity of any of these things that that's not really front and center. Christianity is kind of unique uh, due to the fact that if you really legitimately found the bones of Christ, then Christianity isn't true. Uh, if you were to uh, you know ask you know your your standard uh, Hindu you know, uh, about the stories of Shiva and Vishnu and things like this, and and the stories in the Vedas, um, they would legitimately say it doesn't matter if this really happened. There's a spiritual truth to this. And there's uh, one of the things that you'll note that when you study the other world religions, God legitimately, or whatever the deity is, seems so far off, so distant. It's almost like the, uh, the un- the unnamed God within Gnosticism, you know, he can't really actually be a part of this creation. And what, what really distinguishes Christianity, uh, we confess it in the creed when we say that Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. Um, and uh, in the opening of the of the Gospel of Luke, when it, you know, the, the, the nativity narrative, when it talks about Caesar Augustus, all this took place in time and space. And our God, rather than being far off, has actually become one of us. And and the definitive proof always comes back to that empty tomb and how do you explain it? But when when you look at the evidence on that, making the positive case for Christianity, now you have you have 
comfort, you have assurance, and you have a God who sees and feels and knows our weaknesses, knows what it's like to be hungry, to blow your nose, and and even to wipe your butt, if I can be so you know bold. But you know, our God knows all of this because He became a man in order to redeem us and to save us from the ultimate evil. And and uh, and that is something that no other religion can offer. And the empty tomb makes that clear. There's a way when, like, if you start with an abstract idea of God, like just sit here and think, oh, God is good and strong and thing. And then you open your eyes and you see suffering. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. dang, that doesn't, that's not what I expected. But yeah. if you start by reading the Bible about what, the, what, like how God is and how things are, like, what do you expect when you look outside? Like, oh yeah, this is, this is what the Bible says things are going to be like. It's going to be miserable out there and it's going to be miserable in here. And yeah. then all of a sudden, the Bible, so so like life disappoints us if we start with an abstraction of God. Life is just exactly how we think it is if we start with the Bible. But then the Bible keeps going to tell about the cross and the empty tomb. And all of a sudden, there's the ex there's the surprise. It's not that things are bad, but that the God who is good and holy is in the in the filth with us to, to save us. Wow. So the, sh so the shock comes not in the misery of life, but in the fact that the Lord dives into the misery to save us from it. Yeah. Beautiful. So there's been a lot of talk about kind of defense, apologetics, proof, those kinds of things, which is there's good proper places for those things to happen. How do you actually handle someone, a youth who comes to you in doubt in serious question as to whether or not this stuff actually is real and whether or not it actually matters. What do you do then? I would note that the question assumes that you're dealing with a Christian youth. Um, sometimes you have to deal with an atheistic youth, and that that's, that's a different thing altogether. I handle atheists and those who are struggling with their faith very differently. Um, I've gotten to the point where if I'm dealing with somebody who just is trolling me and wants to, you know, to make a make a point on Twitter and, you know, for, you know, for atheism that, uh, you know, I basically have one thing to say to them. And since I already know that scripture says they already know that God exists and that they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, I'm not going to play the game with them. Instead, I'll just say, listen, you already know that God exists. So I have a message to deliver to you. And that's this, that he loves you and bled and died for your sins and rose again on the third day. But when you're dealing with a, with a, a, a Christian youth, a, a, somebody who's been catechized, and they've been subjected to these bad arguments, or maybe they're having that dark night of the soul, that's a pastoral uh, issue. And it has to be handled with care, with love, with understanding, and a lot of listening, and then beginning to peel back some of the bad arguments that they're kind of hanging on to because of what's been put into their head. And, and, and noticing and helping them notice this, that Christianity has nothing to fear from a legitimate look at the evidence for the empty tomb. Um, and in fact, you know, many people have tried to disprove Christianity by going after the resurrection and have found themselves safely in the arms of Christ. I think, you know, a lot of old youth ministry, like go back to the 70s, 80s, and youth ministers were always saying, hey, it's okay to doubt. It's okay to question. Now, I think it's two different things. It's always okay to question. The Lord is always ready for questions. But we can say from the first commandment that doubt is a sin Mm -hmm. which is so nice to say, Jesus died for your doubt. <laughs> yeah. You're forgiven for doubting. Uh, this is one of the, our advantages of our Lutheran doctrine of concupiscence, which says that we not only do we sin, but we want to sin, and our wanting to sin is also sin, so that someone can not even sin, but just say yeah. they wanted to, and they can be forgiven of their wanting to sin, which is so nice because it gives us something to do as pastors. So Jesus forgives your doubt, and that and to know that faith comes as a gift and it comes through the word. So here you are, you, you are with the rest of us. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And the Lord has us, he has us hooked and he's reeling us all in uh, until all doubts are cast off by the resurrection. Absolutely. It's it's not whether or not you should have doubts, but it's where do you take them when you have them? Because like you shouldn't have yes. sins either, but what do you do with them since you got them? You take them to your pastor and and you hear forgiveness. But what's wonderful is that this is this is actually something that our Lord delights in. Um, we we can go to uh, Thomas, who is is confessing Thomas, who uh, I in the midst of uh, of one sin that the Lord absolved. And by the way, like if this is the text that he gives us absolution in, we probably shouldn't remember Thomas only by his sin that that seems counterintuitive. 
to me. Um, but, but rather, the Lord keeps coming back and says to Thomas what he needs to hear peace be with you. Um, this is something then that can be not only talked about as if it's a real thing, but it's a real thing that Jesus died for and a real thing that Jesus gives peace to. And even a real thing that Jesus confronts with, with historical reality that lets you confront these doubts and, and think your way through them in, in the, the brother uh, and sisters uh, of Christ that have been united under him, who is the head. There, there's actually a lot of really good stuff going on here. When, when you doubt, it's not, it's not good to doubt, but when you do, the, the Lord is, is prepared for that. And, and he He's sent you a pastor. He sent you brothers and sisters in Christ. Beautiful. We got a really good stuff going on here as well. Uh, Dr. Francisco, Pastor Goodman, Pastor Roseboro, Pastor Wolf Mueller. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, thank you for giving us a little uh, behind the scenes look on how you're putting this all together. And we can't wait to see you all at Beyond a Reasonable Doubt this summer. SIU in Carbondale, Trinity in San Antonio. We'll see you all in July. <laughs>